Hey, I'm going to the grocery store and I want you to come with me. Oh, you know how I love going to the grocery store, but I just loaded this vice. So I'm going to have to load parts singly all day long, so I won't be able to make it with you. I'm sorry. Sean, I know you have clamp rails. Load them up, hit the green button, and let's go. I don't even want to go. The good old clamp rail. Bread for one thing, maximum efficiency and runtime. I'm Sean from SB Solo, and today on Practice Machinist episode of How We Do It, we're gonna go in through 20 years of experience that I've had using clamp rails and some of the things that may catch you if you've never used them before. This is probably one of my number one questions I get on Instagram, so I think this is a long, long time coming video. So let's uh, get into that and just see what they're all about. All right, so how do these clamp rails come about? Well, basically I just need a maximum runtime on the machine because when I program, I cannot stand getting up and getting back down, loading the machine and just trying to figure out where I was at programming. It drives me nuts. So what I tried to do was load my table up maximum as possible and get as much runtime as possible. And you know, if I had a 13 minute runtime and I could load 14 parts, that's over three hours worth of runtime, which was super helpful. I can, you know, put parts on here, lock them down, go, work on my bicycle, my motorcycle, work on the house, <laughs> come back, or go program, you know? So that's how they kind of came about. I've always used like pit bull clamp style clamps all my life, and I've been around. Um, there are a few things you gotta watch out for when you're using them, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, I do wanna kind of show you what I did and how I uh, manufactured these so you guys can get a good explanation of kind of how I'm using them. So first off, I made, long sets of clamp rails. And what happens here is that I have the centerpiece. So these are just your like gripper, uh, one inch grippers that are on the, on the rail here. And on this piece in, alone, I put in one inch different uh, set screws or, or bolts. So if I'm not using a position as a stop, I just put a set screw in it. And the bolts are shoulder bolts that are quarter inch in diameter. So basically, in my CAD, I know exactly where this is at, and I just place the parts wherever I want. So I've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I can load 14 pieces on this of that size. So this clamps to the table with uh, half inch 13 bolts, and it's got half inch dowel pins right here. The half inch dowel pins, basically you set it on the table, and the half inch dowel pins just go in, there's three of them, and then you just bolt it down to the table so it's locked down solid. So I use these half inch dowel pins with the spiral on them. And the spiral, all that does is let air out as you, as you put them down, because it is quite a tight fit. My tables are bushinged, so you kind of have to have that, otherwise they pop back out. So that is kind of the key to using these, is that you have to have a table, a grid pattern on your table. And mine happens to be two inches, because I made it myself. And I ended up putting uh, steel bushings in there. So this basically just goes on here like this, lock it down, and then I can just you know, bolt it down and I have the center rail. Then I have the clamp rails here that will bolt on either side. So it'll be on this side and one on this side. So this is a one inch clamp rail. I have it right here, I've written down one inch. And so what I do is once this is down, if I put it on the closest bolt alignment, I can hold on to one inch parts. If I move it to the next one, I can hold on to three inch parts. If I move it to the next one, I can hold it on to five inch parts. And then I have one and a quarter, one and a half, these are my two inch ones. So if I put it on here, basically I can hold on two inch, then I can hold on to four inch, then I can hold on to six inch. So I basically hit all, all my uh, different widths that I have uh, if I need to. And I also have these shorties here. So these will go perpendicular to the table and I can load that up for, depending on what kind of sizes that I have. So if I load it up on this side, basically what I do is I have the center rail and this, other one right here on the other side, and I have it in here, right? Well, I can have a vise on the other side, so I don't have to load the whole thing across the whole table. So these make it a little bit easier for me to use clamp rails and a vise if I wanted to. So once I have these loaded up, I wanna to talk to you guys about how I use my work offset. And basically, since it's pinned to the table, and I know exactly where these are in my CAD, I use one work offset for the first operations of this. And that's basically in the center of my table right here. I do it that way because one, it's easy to do, and I just know where everything's at. I don't have a probe, but if I did have a probe, I would still do it that way, and I wouldn't probe every one. I may probe, do a maximum material condition to see where it's at, just to do it really fast, but I wouldn't probe each one individually, each offset. There's no reason to, because everything's within two thousandths of itself, two to three, 
So that is how I go about that. So one program will have one offset and it just I just uh, duplicate or translate the tool paths across you know where I where I want to go. So that is how I handle that. These ones are actually quarter inch, so I'm just like brr, 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 putting on number 16 right here and lock those down. I do come back with a Allen key with my hand just to make sure that I hit every one of them because I've ran out of uh, talent and basically forgot to lock one of them down and I run it over and blow up my ML and all that good stuff. So that's the only time I've ever ruined a thread. So I've run these actually, this particular clamp probably for a good 10 years on thousands of pieces and I still am in aluminum threads on this. I don't have them helicoiled. I am just using your standard um, form thread. <laughs> And uh, the only time I ripped the thread out is when I ran over the, the, the clamp and it just, you know, just damaged it. So that's the only time. So they actually last quite a long time. I mean, yeah, you can go and just heavily coil the, the whole thing. But for me, like I didn't want to do that unless I really needed to. And it actually works pretty good. So basically once you have them all loaded up and uh, you're ready to go, I just shut the door, push the button and let it rip, you know, come back three hours later and I have a bunch of chips all over and, you know, we have some complete parts. So that is another thing that I use. I use a fan, a chip fan. This is a, they do catch um, coolant and chips. So using a chip fan blows all that stuff out. It really helps uh, keep down the, the blowing time to blow it out. And uh, yeah, that is the basics of my clamp rails. They work really, really well and they do the job that they're intended to do, and they're very, very cheap. The main reason why I went with this, you know, this way is because I was on a budget. I didn't have much money, and you can make these for super cheap, and you don't have to spend a ton of money, and the only way they really get around, you know, making something that's close to this, which would be really nice, would be like some self-centering vices, uh, just stacked up, but we all know how expensive self-centering vices are, and um, definitely, would cost a fortune compared to what these are. So now you're like, you know what? This is exactly what I want to do. I want to make these. This can be awesome. We're going to run with it and it's going to change my, my business forever. Maybe. <laughs> there are a few things that you need to look out for when you're using this. There is some drawbacks, not in the clamps themselves, but in situations that you'll run into as far as material and just different things like that. So this is going to be a really important part of the video. So uh, stay tuned still, watch to the end because we're going to go into the stuff that you really, really need to know. No, not new. They will be new if you make them, but whatever. So first off, we have the clamp rails, the way they mount. Obviously, we got to put pins and bolts in them. This takes quite a bit of time. The advantage is obviously you get the whole table and you get maximum runtime. That's great. So if I was to do this again, I would probably have a, like a ball lock or a uniblock or a uniball systems where I can lock these in and put them in really fast and uh, you know, not have to deal with putting the bolt holes in them, the pins and stuff like that. But if I was gonna go that route, I might as well make pallets. I think pallets would probably be better to use just because that when you have a pallet, you can load out here. So that goes in the next, the next thing is when you load or unload, the machine's stalled. So the machine's waiting for you to take them out. Sometimes they just go real fast and it's not like that crazy, but it is nice to be able to have a pallet and then lock it in place and then shut the door, press go, and then undo it, blow it off, you know, that whole, that whole deal. So you're saving time there. Like I said, this was just like, I needed something fast, this is cheap, and it's the best way to do it. So that's what I would say I would do later on if I had to do this again, is make sure I had like an offloading system somehow that was quick load. All right, so once you have the pallet or whatever, let's say you gotta make these clamp rails or you gotta make a pallet. Here's a little bit of a tip. When you cut the channel, for these clamp rails or the clamps to go into, they have a little radius on the back side of them. And what they do is they pivot. And when they pivot, they push on the back wall, which they start to wear out and they start to push back. So a lot of people will put a steel, um, you know, backer, or they'll leave these heavy and they'll cut them back to clean them up. But that changes where your throw is because that's a big problem. So what I do is I put a radius the same size as the the clamp itself. So don't use a sharp corner in there just use a radius that is the same size as the clamp. That way it's pushing all that material to try and push it back versus like one point of the tangent, the other point down. So it's gonna keep your clamp rails running forever. And man, I've used these so long and they're still perfectly fine, same clamp pressure. So that's a big, uh, big tip to have when you're making these. The other thing I might do is maybe notch these out possibly to let chips fly out. 
Um, I didn't do that. I may do that later and possibly make caps for these holes because they do fill up with coolant. So maybe 3D print some caps. So those are things you want to kind of want to think about for convenience, convenience wise. But other than that, as far as building them, they're pretty straightforward. Um, just, yeah, make sure you have some backing back there and the radius works pretty good for me. So, so the way these clamps work is they push and pull down at the same time. It makes them super, super strong. That's a huge advantage when you're grabbing on the stock. It is a disadvantage though, when you're trying to do thin stuff or um, something you're trying to get flat. So if you're thinking that you need to do some really thin parts, do some flat, what it's gonna do is try and pull it down to this deck and then it's gonna distort to the shape of the, you know, the bottom. And then when you release, it's gonna spring back. So those are times where you probably wouldn't wanna use these. Probably not the best, but most of the time I'm just doing thicker billet. I mean, I've done half inch billet and it's totally fine. This locks it down and we're totally good to go, but that is something to be aware of when you're using them. Okay, so now we're getting down to like the big problems you're gonna have when you start putting stock, extruded stock in your clamp rails. <laughs> so I, the way I like to run my parts is I like to run a very thin carrier, carrier on the bottom, so much so that I run, you know, I'll run all the way down to eighth inch thick. So to do that, the clamps, if the material is thick, the clamps will go up high. And if the material is thin, the clamps will drop low. And so you have to be in that perfect range. So if you model this and model it to nominal, and you, if I pin my clamp rails to the table at nominal, you know, it's gonna clamp just in the perfect position. But what you guys won't know if you've never bought stock before, your stock varies. I've seen it vary up to 45 thousandths of width thickness. That's a huge problem. <laughs> Something that I didn't think about when I first did it. And what had was happening was my clamp rails were lifting and then I was getting my end mill rougher just totally wiping out all my clamps, which is super annoying, okay? So we don't wanna do that. But the other flip side is, is that I've had material that was undersized and my clamp rails went too low. And then when it went too low, I was spitting parts out. So I basically had to pull the pins out of my, my rail, my floating rail, and I had to actually push it and use the slop in the bolt holes and then just kind of clamp them down to the right height and then lock it down. That's another super annoying thing I had to do because you know, just because the material thickness isn't very good and I'm going for maximum thinness on my carrier. Now, if you're running a thicker carrier, then you can just butt them in real tight and you can have that cam way high and it's not gonna matter because you're not gonna hit the cam. Well, for me, I don't like to do that because I don't like to rough extra stuff off the back and all my stuff is basically designed around like you know the 100 thou step serrated jaws on my vices and so I wanted to keep it the same way. So that, <laughs> that was pretty problematic for me, to, to, me to, to do or deal with. So I just wanted you guys to understand that that is one of the biggest problems. The other problem is when you buy material, another problem with material is material isn't always flat. It's got a crown in it. So if you have too much deck on your rail itself, it'll sit more in the center and then it won't sit on the edge. And so that even brings the, even the clamp is close, the clamp will bite down and then there won't be as much material to hold on to. Going into that, not only that, clamp or extruded material has different radiuses they have on the edges. I've had stuff is super sharp, like this bar is really sharp, but I've had stuff almost have 40, 50 thousandths of radius. So what happens is that you don't have any meat to grab into. So now if this is short, the radius is small and you go to pinch down and grab it, you pretty much only have like 30 thousandths more material to, to grab onto and it's definitely gonna rip out. And that's a huge problem that I had to run into too. And that's why I have to push my clamp rails farther forward. And uh, it's, it's gotten to the point where whenever I get material in, I have to measure the material, every one of them. And if I have shorter ones or thicker ones, I have to segregate them and then adjust as I go through the, the thing, depending on the bar. So when everything's going against you, your part's too short, you have big radiuses on your corner, then you get a part like this, which has been ripped out, blended in the machine and wreaks havoc to where I blew up two of my, my clamps because the clamps lifted and they were just floating and the ML hit and blew up my ML. And yeah, it's a no good situation. So I constantly look down the rail after I clamp and make sure everything's tight and, uh, you know, just want to make sure that everything's going. It's just a fail safe. I do want to show you, I, would, I did want to say one thing about how I set these up in my software. 
when I set them in my software, I have these as templates and I have them on different levels. So my software uses different levels. Basically I have an Excel spreadsheet. So whenever I do like custom fixturing that I know is gonna be used like modular fixturing for different types of parts, I'll basically put them on a different level so that nothing overlaps and I'll put it in my Excel spreadsheet. All the nomenclature matches. So that way when I bring in the template, it just populates and then I can just use the ones I want. Um, I think that's pretty important to be efficient that way. But I do wanna do another video on that at some point. All right, so that's my clamp rails, guys. That's everything I know in the last 20 years. I do wanna reiterate that if you're gonna use these for any irregular shapes like castings or something like that, you're probably gonna to have to calibrate a certain size that it needs to land into. Because if it's thick or thin, you're gonna have a lot of problems. It doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, you'll start blowing stuff up. So um, just keep that in mind when you're making these things. But until then, hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, see you on the next one. Later.